Good afternoon, Year 10. Nice to see you again. Uh, welcome back to another video lesson on Macbeth. And in today's lesson, we are looking at Act 1, Scene 5. So in Act 1, Scene 5, the reader is first introduced to Lady Macbeth, the wife of the tragic hero, uh, Macbeth. Uh, and she's a fascinating and sinister and brilliant character who has a very, very significant role to play in the wider play. I thought I'd use this portrait of Macbeth, Lady Macbeth as a starting point. Um, clearly, just from the portrait itself, uh, you can, I'm sure all of us can detect what the painting is about. It's about the ambition and the, uh, and the hunger for power that Lady Macbeth possesses. And she's an incredibly interesting character for those reasons. It's actually Lady Macbeth who goads Macbeth into committing the regicide, which takes place later on. It's Lady Macbeth who m manages to persuade her husband through a, through a, through questioning his masculinity in effect uh, to commit the deed, and she will pay a, a huge uh, personal cost uh, for that uh, sin later on in the play. So this is Lady Macbeth uh, being first introduced to us as an audience in Act One, Scene Five. Okay, before we actually read the scene itself, let's have a look at the stage directions like we did last time at, that opened the scene. It, it's set in Inverness, which is in northern Scotland. Uh, it's in Macbeth's castle, which is known as Dunsinane. Uh, and we have Lady Macbeth being introduced reading a letter. And the letter is from Macbeth, and it, it essentially describes to her uh, what has taken place in terms of his visitations uh, and his encounters with the witches and the report of the battle. And most importantly, he tells his wife about the predictions that the witches have made, the prophecies that they've made, and his future uh, as being king of Scotland. And what we need to look out for as, as we read this scene is the difference, I'd say, or the um, dissimilarity between Macbeth's reaction to the news that he'll one day become king and Lady Macbeth's. Uh, how Macbeth initially hesitates and ponders the question, ponders the meaning, and uh, is disturbed by the idea of murder when he when he first conceives the idea. And let's compare that to Lady Macbeth. If you have a chance, I would really recommend before we read this, there's a fantastic performance by Judy Dench uh, of this scene. If you if you YouTube, uh, look on YouTube, another YouTube uh, tab, open up another another tab. Uh, if you search for Act 1, Scene 5 and Judy Dench, she delivers a brilliant performance of this particular scene in the uh, version of Macbeth, the adaptation of Macbeth, uh, ad directed by Trevor Nunn. It's an old version, but it's a brilliantly well-acted uh, scene. Okay, so I'm going to go from uh, Glam's Thou Art, Thou Art, because I'm not going to read the part about the letter. It's it's literally a description of what happens. There's a couple of important moments, such as him saying, you know, lay it to thy heart, which means, you know, don't tell anyone about what I've just told you. Keep it our secret. So she becomes immediately uh, Macbeth's confidant, which means his trusted uh, ally, his trusted um, associates, the one, the person who knows, you know, who, who knows the secrets of his heart uh, and who will conspire with him. Which is, which is very important. He's, he's, he does trust her to keep this information secret. So I'm just going to read the, the speech first and then we'll go over the speech here in a bit more detail. So she says, Glams, Glams thou art, and cordor, and shalt be what thou art promised. And yet do I fear thy nature, it is too full of the milk of human kindness to catch the nearest way. Thou wouldst be great, art not without ambition, but without the illness that should attend it. What thou wast highly, thou wast holily, wast not play false, and yet wast wrongly win. Thou wast have great glams at that which cries, Thus thou must do it, if thou have it, and that which rather thou dost fear to do, than wishest should be, done, uh, should be undone. Hie thee hither, that I may pour my spirits in thine ear, and chastise with the valour of my tongue all that impedes thee from the golden round, which fate and metaphysical aid doth seem to have thee crowned withal. And then a messenger enters and interrupts her soliloquy. So this is actually our first proper soliloquy of the entire play. I'll, I'll write the word for you here. Um, we've talked about the meaning of this term. It just means a, a monologue, a, a speech given by a character when they're on stage on their own. And it's a brilliant opportunity for the playwright to explore 
the psychology of the character, the mindset of the character, and for the audience to learn about their um, their intentions and their motivations. And Lady Macbeth's motivations are fairly uh, explicit. She doesn't hide her pleasure at hearing the, no the, the news that her husband will soon be king. And she's in fact far more ambitious and far more uh, impatient in a sense than he, than he was. So she's, the, the, line, the, the speech starts with the words, glams thou art and cordor and shalt be what thou art promised. And it essentially it's a bit like the opening argument in a sense, because she's laying out the, her argument that she'll develop throughout the speech. Uh, she's saying you're currently you're currently the thane of of Glam's. You'll be the thane of Cordor, and you'll be what you are promised, which means you'll become the king of Scotland. And she doesn't seem to mind. This word "promise" is quite important. She doesn't seem to mind the fact that he's been promised this uh, promotion to you know to become king of Scotland by demonic forces. She doesn't seem that doesn't seem to bother her at all. She doesn't have any uh, ha have any what we call scruples, which is kind of a moral scruples are you know of, of the voice in your head or the conscience that would tell you not to do something. She doesn't seem to have that. She seems to be um, welcoming the news immediately. You'll be what thou art promised. Then we have this colon here and she starts to list um, her doubts. Uh, she she thinks that he should he should become the king um, but she has her doubts, not about whether or not he will, but about, about whether or not he has what it takes to commit regicide. Uh, notice how, in a similar way to Macbeth, her thoughts, like Macbeth's, immediately spring to murder uh, and to regicide. The witches don't themselves say he has to commit regicide, but she immediately uh, makes that inference and follows that uh, thought process of, of, of committing a, a terrible act of murder upon the king. She says, yet do I fear thy nature. It is too full of the milk of human kindness to catch the nearest way. And we'll pause there. And she's speaking here metaphorically. This is a metaphor. Uh, he's full of the milk of human kindness. And it's a, it's a strange um, metaphor. It's almost as if she's infantilizing him, as, as if she's treating him like an infant that suckles uh, on its mother's breasts for milk. Um, it's almost as if he is... Being, she's looking down upon him and, cond and being quite condescending, I guess. He, he's too full of the milk of human kindness. Metaphorically, she, meets, she means that he's, he's too good a person. He, he has um, too strong a sense of morality, of right and wrong, to commit this murder, to commit this regicide. Too full of the milk of human kindness. Um, and students always get confused by, the, by how this line runs on. She's He's too full of the milk of human kindness to catch the nearest way. That's kind of, she's kind of using what we call litotes or understatement. I'll write the word for you there. So what she actually means by that is he's too he's too uh, good he's too good natured to commit an act of murder to catch the nearest way. That's what she means by catch the nearest way. Um, students sometimes get confused by that. She then continues to develop her argument and her and her and we we continue to see her thoughts unravel and that's the kind of that's the the point i suppose or the dramatic function of a soliloquy we see the thoughts of these characters unravel before us and we learn their most motivations we learn uh their intentions here she says thou wouldst be great are not without ambition but without the illness that should attend it and you'll notice a lot here that she's using the conditional tense uh, so it's not the future tense, not the past tense, not the present tense, but it's a conditional tense. It's a, 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 t a tense based on the condition of whether or not he will do it. And she says, you would be great. You're not without ambition. We, we can understand what she means by that. Uh, but without the illness that should attend it. And here she makes a really kind of um, cynical uh, and, and kind of pessimistic declaration that in order to have, in order to be, powerful in order to gain power it's it's no good to just be ambitious you have to be i mean i guess the word e illness could be substituted for the word e evil right she's saying you're you're not unambitious but you don't have the uh, cunning you don't have the evil you don't have the uh, nous to get what you want to achieve your ambitions um and i think what's immediately interesting beyond that is that, that illness again, kind of associates itself with the supernatural and the witches. 
And it's quite interesting how quickly she seems to side with the witches. She seems to see the witches as prophets of glory. She doesn't seem to be, she doesn't seem to doubt the witches' intentions at all. Lots of critics have read this, uh, have read the character of Lady Macbeth as being a third, so not a third, of course, not a, a fourth witch or an additional witch, uh, and that she has a kind of anti-mother like um, disposition. She's presented as being almost unfeminine and unmaternal. And it is interesting how quickly she sides with the supernatural forces here. So he's not without the illness that should attend the ambition. OK, then she carries on. We've got another code on. It's still developing. We've still got this unravelling of thoughts uh, pouring out. It's almost it's almost what we would call stream of consciousness. It's almost stream of consciousness. It's almost as if her thoughts are just pouring out one upon one after the other. She continues, what thou wouldst highly, thou wouldst thou wholly. So again, it's talk, she's talking about, in the conditional tense, about his ambitions. You, you, want, you want these high ambitions. That's what she means. She, you want to have these lofty ambitions. So you want to be the king. You have these lofty ambitions. However, in order to become the king, this is quite confusing. Students always find this a bit confusing. In order to become the king, you would want to do so holily. So what she means by that, and that's the key word here, that adjective, holily, what she means by that is that she's accusing Macbeth of being unprepared to commit uh, an evil act in order to achieve his ambitions. She's saying about, about him essentially that you're too virtuous, you're too good, you're too noble, you have too strong a sense of morality, you wouldn't do something evil. Uh, sorry, you wouldn't do something, yeah, you wouldn't do something evil in order to get... Uh, to, to gain power, which is, and clearly the implication is that she, on the other hand, would do something unholy to get, to gain, the, to, to achieve the ambition that she has. So she would do something unholy to achieve the ambition that she has. And then she continues, and we, I've, I've kind of penciled over, we've got another colon, so another thought uh, being followed in this chain of our chain of logic here. She says, you would not play false and yet you would wrongly win. And that's, that seems to be, to, to my mind, a paradox. That seems to be an oxymoron. That doesn't seem to make sense to me. And it reminds me of how the witches speak in paradoxes and riddles and enigmas. And it, remind, and it kind of supports the reading that she could be interpreted as a fourth or an additional witch. And she's essentially saying here, you would not play false, you would not cheat uh, but you would wrongly win, so you would win falsely. So it's a kind of, like I said, it's the paradox. So he's not essentially. This is the key part. She's saying to, about Macbeth, you're not prepared to commit uh, foul play. And foul play is the phrase that gets used later on in the play. Uh, foul play just it, it means murder. It's, again, it's a euphemism. It's an example of litotes of understatement. Okay, that was play false. Um, and then again, another colon, and the, and the thoughts continue. Thou wouldst have great glams, that which cries, that m thou must do if thou have it, and that which rather thou dost fear to do, than wishest should be undone. She's essentially saying here that there's something that you want, great glams. Um, there's something that you need to do, uh, but you fear to do it. Uh, and you wish it, that you didn't have to, essentially. And... Essentially, what she's saying here is that she's she's prepared to do the unthinkable, the thing that he fears to do, which is, of course, uh, the act of regicide. He is hesitant. He knows the moral implications of committing this act of regicide. She is all the more happy to help. And that's confirmed by her then moving on in the soliloquy. She says, hi thee hither, which means come to me. But there's a kind of sinister edge to the use of the the, the, the use of language here, hi thee, hither, that kind of hissing noise with the th. Uh, she's she's very serpent-like, isn't she? Hi thee, hither, come closer, come to me, uh, so I may pour my spirits on thine ear. And it kind of, I said she's quite serpent-like. Uh, I'll write the serpent. She's quite, she, she's a symbol of, you know, evil. She's quite satanic immediately. Um, and that is underscored by this image of her, the imagery here of pouring spirits in his ear, uh, it, which is a kind of hideous image in, in a sense because it 
underscores or emphasizes this idea of her being venomous, but also uh, is, an, is, an, is an explicit reference to murder. Uh, this, is a, this is a reference to a, a, a murder, a method of murder, of poisoning your victim by pouring uh, poison into their ear. So she's kind of already almost, almost joking about uh, the murder, being you know, quite blasé about mentioning a method of murder. For those of you who've read Hamlet, you'll know that that's how Hamlet's father is murdered by his uncle Claudius while he's asleep. Uh, his uncle Claudius pours uh, poison into the sleeping king's ear. Anyway, so she says, I may pour my spirits in thine ear. And the, met and the spirits are metaphorical. And what she means by that are, you know, pouring evil spirits. So already she's very much associating herself with, with Satan, with the devil, with the witches. Uh, and she's going to pour spirits metaphorically into his ears to convince him to partake in this murder. That's that's the meaning of the one of the possible interpretations for this metaphor, that she will uh, persuade him, she will push him over the edge. And chastise with the valour of my tongue all that impedes thee from the golden round. So she's going to chastise kind of, um, she's going to convince him, she's going to convince him in a kind of, motherly way almost like a, a mother would chastise uh, her her infant it would, it's a way of um kind of rebuking or reprimanding so she's going to rebuke him with the, with the valor of her tongue and interesting that she she uses this phrase because it kind of again is quite subversive and i'll drop that word down for you which means it goes against the expectations uh, of the audience in a sense because uh, she's supposed to be you know she's a woman she's supposed to behave in an effeminate way she's supposed she's supposed to be meek and mild uh, and timid and you know um she's the absolute opposite here isn't she she's she's saying i will speak boldly and she'll speak in a way that is unf unfemale unfeminine um and all that impedes thee from the golden round uh, will be will disperse that so all that gets in your way that's what she means by impede that same root word of impediment everything that gets in the way of in your way from the golden round and the golden round is a metaphor um, and I'll just jot that down where I've got space here it's metaphorical uh, and of course I'm sure most of us can understand the meaning of the metaphor the golden round is the crown itself so she's going to use her powers of persuasion her evil powers of persuasion to convince him to commit the act of regicide and so that he can wear the golden round the crown of Scotland which she says confidently, fate and metaphysical aid have uh, doth see, seem to have thee crowned withal. Which, which means she's, what she's saying here is that uh, he has been guided by fate. Uh, and that's interesting because the fate, the characters that play the fate with a capital F are the witches, really, aren't they? Um, and what she's what she's saying here is that it seems as if you are destined. It seems as if you are destined to become the king. It seems as if you are being guided to that golden round by a higher power, and the higher power are in fact the witches. And she doesn't. Again, it's quite interesting how she doesn't seem to have any um, doubts about the witches. She seems to trust them fully, and the, and the prophecies fully. She doesn't seem to question them at all. Um, and arguably, that that might be her tragic flaw in her character i'll put that down as well that, that might be her hamasha her tragic flaw that she just you know believes uh, takes their um prophecies at face value which fate and metaphysical aid Metaph metaphysical metaphysical means beyond the physical so meta always means beyond it's the greek for beyond uh, so metaphysical means beyond the physical so supernatural aid so again she's referring back to the witches and how he, they seem to be pulling uh, the threads of this narrative and weaving the, th the um, tapestry of the story. And Doth seem to have the crown withal. They seem to have. Uh, they seem to have tried to get you get you to become a king. They seem to have had you crowned. That's the simple ending to that to that soliloquy. Okay, and then we have and then she's interrupted. The soliloquy is broken uh, and interrupted by the messenger. And I'll just quickly go through that scene. I'm not going to go into too much detail here. The messenger says, what is your, uh, so she says to the messenger, what's your tidings? What, which means what news do you have? The messenger replies, the king comes here tonight. 
Lady Macbeth, thou, thou art mad to say it. Is not thy master with him? Who worked so would have informed you? So she didn't know about this part of the, Macbeth failed to mention this, that King Duncan is coming to visit their house, their castle this evening. Um, and she's annoyed and angry that, that, that Macbeth has neglected to mention that. The messenger says, so please, if it is true, our thane is coming. One of my fellows had speed of him, who almost dead for breath had scarcely more than would make up his message. So he basically a messenger outran or out um, rode Macbeth to get to the castle first. And Lady Macbeth responds, give him tending, he brings great news. And then we have uh, another break where the, ex where the messenger exits and we have a second soliloquy or basically the continuation of this first soliloquy. However, we, Year 10, are going to pause there and you are going to uh, give me a summary of the first part of this soliloquy in Act 1, Scene 5. Um, how is Lady Macbeth presented? That's what I'd like to think about. Uh, use your notes and read through your notes first. Again, just a reminder about the advantages of watching this on video. You can re rewind, you can watch bits again, you can uh, pause the video multiple times. So please do that for me. And I'll see you in about 10 minutes. So I can ask you to pause the video now, please. Okay, welcome back. We're now going to look at the continuation of this soliloquy on Act 1, Scene 5. Uh, and this is the part that's really the most memorable part. Uh, it's quite an iconic moment in the play. So Lady Macbeth continues, I'll carry on from the raven. The raven himself is horse that croaks the fatal entrance of Duncan under my battlements. Come, you spirits that tend on mortal thoughts, unsex me here and fill me from the crown to the toe, top full of direst cruelty. Make thick my blood, stop up the passage and access to remorse. Uh, that no compunctious visitings of nature shake my fell purpose, nor keep peace between the effect and it. Come to my woman's breasts and take my milk for gall, you murdering ministers, wherever in your sight the substances you wait on nature's mischief. Come, thick night, and pile thee in the dunnest smoke of hell, that my keen knife see not the wound it makes, nor heaven peep through the blankets of the dark to cry, hold, hold. And then Macbeth enters, and she greets Macbeth and says, Great galams, worthy cordor, greater than both by the all hail hereafter. Thy letters have transported me beyond this ignorant present, and I feel now the future in the instant. Brilliant piece of writing. Uh, so, let's go through this soliloquy. The first thing I'm sure you notice as well is the use, she's speaking in figurative language, so she's speaking in metaphorical language. Uh, this is not literal, but it's loaded with symbolic meaning and deeper, deeper meaning. So the first thing that is most interesting is the, is the, is the reference to the raven, that black carrion bird. A, a carrion bird is a bird that feeds off uh, the flesh of, of dead animals. Uh, they're otherwise known as corvids, and you have crows, magpies, ravens, daws, jackdaws. Shakespeare often references these types of birds in his plays because they're symbols of bad luck and they're, and they're, 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 symbol, they're, they're omens. Uh, so it's an example here of foreshadowing. So she's talking about this metaphorical raven, the symbol of doom. The raven himself is horse that croaks the, the fatal entrance of Duncan under my basement. And the ravens, ravens, if you ever, if you ever have watched horror films, or if you've ever walked through the woods and you'll hear the kind of horse-like croak, croak of a raven, uh, they're often uh, seen as kind of heralds of murder, of death. Uh, and in this case, the raven has been croaking so, so much uh, for, and uh, that, that it's lost, it's, it's losing its voice. The voice, the croak is actually hoarse. Um, and why is, it, why is it croaking? Why is it hoarse? Because it's warning Duncan of his entrance into this castle under my battlements. The battlement is the parapet, the top uh, of a castle's walls, so the kind of top of the building. So the raven is croaking itself hoarse because it's, it's announcing the fatal entrance which is this lovely, well, I say lovely, it's actually not lovely at all, it's a sinister oxymoron. Uh, he's entering as a guest uh, into her house, and again, there's a, cult, there's a kind of cultural expectation that you treat your guests well, you protect your guests, you serve your guests, you, 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 you're a good host. In this sense, he's entering into a battlement that, is, uh, that he, will not, he will not leave alive from. So it's, 
it's uh, heralding his doom. Then we have the fascinating part, and you would have noticed the repetition of the phrase come. There is a kind of sexual element to this speech. It is quite um, loaded with sexual imagery, especially imagery to do with gender and sexuality. Come, you spirits that tend on mortal thoughts, unsex me here. And this metaphor is always very intriguing for students. They just don't quite understand what she's getting at. I suppose there are lots of possible meanings here. I mean, she's summoning evil spirits, isn't she? She's summoning the, the devil's spirit. She's summoning demons to her. And we'll th think about why she's doing that. But uh, the most obvious reason is because of her. She has these evil intentions of regicide. So she summons these spirits that usually tend on mortal thoughts. And she, so these spirits are unlike her, immortal. So they are supernatural spirits that she's summoning. Um, she says, come, you know, and again, most people would ward off these evil spirits. So it's so interesting that she, she actually encourages them. Unsex me. So many possible interpretations. I'm sure you have your own. I read it, I read it personally as uh, a request that she loses her feminine traits. Again, remember, she's a woman in medieval Scotland. There are so many cultural expectations and cultural norms that women were expected to live by and follow. I think when she says unsex me, she's talking about rid me of these cultural norms and these cultural expectations. Uh, allow me to behave in a way that is unfitting, unbecoming and unlike uh, a woman at this time. That's my personal interpretation. But you could say she, you know, there's others as well. She could, she could be, you know, more simplistically just asking to behave like a man as men are associated with acts of violence. Um, she could be talking about again because there's this kind of aspect to it that's that's a kind of she's it's, she's talking as if she's you know virginal she's maybe asking for this again with the with the image later on of the of the knife she's making it a twisted joke about penetration perhaps um which later the knife will be used to penetrate the the, the body of king duncan so there's lots of different possible meanings to this unsex me here it always causes fascination for students they always find it a very interesting choice of language or figures of language um and and lots of the students lots of students previously have picked out the sexualized nature of the imagery here as well fill me she says from the crown to the toe top full of direst cruelty and that's part of the soliloquy is more straightforward she wants to be transformed uh, this is essentially a metamorphosis uh, a, a complete transformation from one thing to another uh, butterflies undergo metamorphosis when they enter the when they create a chrysalis they come out as a completely different uh, creature as a butterfly the caterpillar will enter form a chrysalis and come out as a butterfly and she's talking about a transformation where she goes from a typical medieval woman a, a wife a woman who's associated with the domestic space uh, and she becomes in this transformation a murderer uh, a, a villain someone capable of committing the greatest sin the greatest the most sinful act you could possibly imagine the, the murder of a divinely appointed king so fill me with direst cruelty from the crown which means the top of the head to so again emphasizing this idea of complete transformation she develops this point stop up the access and passage to remorse that no compunctuous visitings of nature shake my fell purpose uh, so she's essentially asking, again, it's, it's entirely metaphorical. Uh, she's, she's asking to be clogged up, in a sense. She's asking to be, um, she's asking for her conscience and her sense of morality to be completely uh, muted, completely silenced. Stop the access and passage to remorse. She doesn't want to feel any guilt. And it's an interesting imperative because she, she's, she's commanding the spirits in the same way that Macbeth tried to command the witches. Stop up the access and passage to remorse, that no compunctuous visitings of nature shake my fell purpose. This metaphor is a bit more difficult. It's a personification of nature. What she means is that she doesn't want any feelings of guilt to stop her from committing her acts. Her fell purpose is the murder. She doesn't want to shake. She doesn't want to, uh, I'll say, change her mind. She doesn't want to change her mind. Uh, she doesn't want any feelings of guilt. That's what compunctuous means. It means a scruple. She doesn't want any feelings of guilt to stop her from committing the act of regicide. 
nor keep peace between the effect and it, uh, which is more even even more self-explanatory, nor to stop to keep the peace between the effect that she wants and it, the act of murder. Okay, we're going to pause there for two seconds. Um, and then we're going to go on to look here at the next part. So it's, it's essentially a shift in the soliloquy. Come to my woman's breasts. And notice how sexualized the speech is. It's, it's a very kind of strange, um, sinister, grotesque transformation she's going under. Come to my woman's breasts. Again, the woman's breasts we'll come back to. And take my milk for gall, you murdering ministers. And she's, again, a, the, the, the convention, the typical image we associate with a woman's breasts and milk would be the breastfeeding. And you would, you would talk about an image of a maternal figure breastfeeding the child. And what she's doing here, Lady Macbeth, is she's subverting that image and she's making it into a twisted one, into a macabre image, into a grotesque image, because she's summoning to her woman's breasts uh, mer demons, murdering ministers. The alliteration is... Uh, has it has that kind of it's almost as if she's uh, growling and murdering ministers so she's summoning demons to her breasts uh, to nurture them so rather than nurturing young or nurturing an infant she is nurturing the uh, minions of satan she's she's feeding evil itself whatever in your sightless substance you wait on nature's mischief uh, and again, wherever, wherever, wherever you lurk to wait upon nature's mischief, to wait upon evil, nature's evil acts. Going back to this idea, we've also got another transmutation. The milk turns into poison. So again, this has happened a few times now. This serpent imagery, this venomous serpent imagery comes up again. And she is saying that she wants the, her, the milk in her breast to be transformed or transmutated into poison. Again, that sexualized come, come, that imperative, thick night, um, and pal thee in the dunnest smoke of hell. This is very, very similar to the line we looked at earlier from Macbeth when he summons darkness to commit the acts. When he starts visualizing the acts of murder. He says, uh, stars hide your fires, let not light see my deep and dark desires. And similarly, Lady Macbeth here, come thick night and pal thee in the dunnest smoke of hell. The V here is the U, is, is the night. So she's hoping that a thick darkness arrives. That's what she's summoning. And she's hoping that it becomes pale with the smokes of hell. It's almost as if it's, almost as if it's like a, an, an image of a woman powdering her face. But th in this case, it's, a, it's another twisted image. It's, a, it's the night itself powdering its face with smoke. But again, lots of images of femininity and of sexuality and of gender... Uh, and sort of strange twists of those expectations, strange subversions of those expectations. Um, and then we carry on to the to the point that we mentioned earlier, that my keen knife see not the wound it makes. And that's the same thing as uh, as what Macbeth said, really, when he says, you know, that I wink at the hand. He asked for, he asked for blindness. He doesn't want to be able to see what he's about to do because he knows it's such a terrible deed. The knife is personified as being keen, it's enthusiastic. And in this scene, just like Macbeth, who used his imagination to visualise the acts of murder, Lady Macbeth here is visualising the acts of murder for herself, which indicates to us that she's prepared to commit the acts of murder. That's interesting when we look at what happens later on. So her, her knife is keen, it's enthusiastic, it's ready to, to be, to be um, it's ready to thrust into, into Duncan, essentially. And she's ready to do it. She's keen as well, um, which is interesting. It also goes back to that image of penetration from earlier. That my keen knife see not the wound it makes, nor heaven peep through the blanket of the, of the dark. Ah, so just like Macbeth, it's, it's, almost a, it's almost a parallel image, isn't it? Macbeth says, stars hide your fires. Lady Macbeth says, uh, I hope uh, you know, the smoke of hell covers the night sky so that the stars are hidden as well. It's a very similar parallel image. So the gods or gods can't see through the blanket of the dark to cry hold, hold, to cry stop, stop, um, or halt. Which is important because what she's saying here is that uh, 
she doesn't want the god god or the gods to see what she's do doing because she knows she's fully aware that what she's about to commit is a mortal sin is a terrible act of blasphemy and yet somehow this is why i find this place so uh fascinating somehow we later managed to sympathize with lady macbeth despite this monstrous betrayal uh, and this monstrous you know depiction she's presented as being no better than the witches really uh, we somehow managed to sympathize for her later on okay that's the end of that section of the soliloquy so i'm going to ask you now to go over the soliloquy from the raven down until hold hold and i'm going to give you about 15 minutes to write a summary of that soliloquy please and i'll see you afterwards so please pause the video okay welcome back we're going to read down to the end of this page which is the end of act one scene five uh, and then I'm going to ask you to complete the independent task that I've set you in the, and complete the quiz. So Macbeth enters and Lady Macbeth clearly flattering him. Great glams, worthy cordor. Uh, again, these are similar uh, adjectives to the ones that uh, Duncan used earlier on in the play. Greater than both by the all hail hereafter. And essentially she's she's making reference to the prophecies and how he will be greater than both of those titles. He'll, he'll eventually be the king. Um, and she's flattering him. She, she then delivers this brilliant metaphor. Uh, Thy letters have transported me beyond the ignorant present. And I feel now the future in the instant. And she's talking about, metaphorically he's talking about tra time travel. His letter about the predictions has led to her, you know, tr transporting herself in her imagination to the future. Uh, and she wants to ignore the, the present where they're currently just, you know, he's just the thane. And she wants to bask in the prophecies and in the future idea of him being king and herself being queen. Um, it's a brilliant metaphor that. Macbeth responds, my dearest love, Duncan comes here tonight, Lady Macbeth. And when goes he hence? Tomorrow as he purposes. So essentially that just means, you know, well, we know what that means. Uh, she asks, where is he going afterwards? He says, tomorrow as he is supposed to. And she delivers a brilliant uh, and kind of sinister uh, piece of dialogue here. And I'll just read it for you first and to give you an impression of the tone of it, the mood of it. Oh, never shall sun that morrow see. Your face, my thane, is as a book where men may read strange matters. To beguile the time, look like the time. Bear welcome in your eye, your hand, your tongue. Look like the innocent flower, but be the serpent under it. He that's coming must be provided for, and you shall be put this night's great business into my dispatch, which shall to all our nights and days to come give solely sovereign sway and masterdom. And it's brilliant because it's completely subversive. Uh, Lady Macbeth is, is suggesting that she becomes the active agent, the one who will actually commit this deed and he will simply be her accomplice it's the opposite of what you'd expect in terms of the gender expectations but it's brilliant for lots of other reasons as well first we have this brilliant use of metaphor oh son and oh never shall son that morrow see uh, and it's interesting that she chooses the sun in this metaphor she chooses and the metaphor is always just a comparison isn't it and it's interesting that she chooses to compare the uh doomed king duncan to the object of the sun, the celestial object of the sun, the heart of our solar system. It's very interesting that she chooses that because of the sun's associations with divinity, with light, with God's light, with um, being a nourisher. There are so many possible interpretations for that. But it's a brilliant quote. Oh, never shall sun that morrow see. This sun will not rise tomorrow. Uh, and possibly more subtly than that, is she introduces the theme, one of the main themes of the play, which is disorder and the unnatural elements that it, that is the result of the murder, which is which is, is itself unnatural. So it, it's obviously unnatural for the sun to not see the next day. That's that would break, you know, the, that would go against the history of of life on Earth and of, of the Earth itself. The, the sun always rises, uh, and for her to say the sun will not rise tomorrow suggests. Uh, and then it kind of emphasises the disorder that they are going to unleash by killing King Duncan. They're going to commit an act that is completely unnatural 
as unnatural as if they were to prevent the sun from rising. But it's a very interesting choice to compare the king to the sun. Clearly something happens in Macbeth, Macbeth's facial expression or body language because she, she then goads him and kind of uh, accuses him of looking uh, slightly hesitant. And she says, your face, my lord, is a book where men may read strange matters. And faces in Shakespeare are often compared to books being, being either hard or difficult to read or easy to read, depending on the emotion of the character. But she's clearly noticing in his face that he is not as set on the act of murder as she herself is. And she gives him advice. She gives him some advice in order to commit this terrible, terrible deed. She says, in order to beguile the time, uh, look like the time. Uh, in order to beguile the time, look like the time, in order to charm someone, in order to charm uh, the time, in order to let the time pass pleasantly, uh, look like it. Act in it. She's saying essentially here, become deceptive, put on a false put on a false appearance, put on a false show, wear a mask, essentially, is what she's saying here. Uh, your hand, your, look, look like the time, bear welcome in your eye, your hand, your tongue. And she's telling him to put on a performance, to deceive, to put on an act uh, when King Duncan arrives, to make him, uh, to obviously to ensure that he doesn't have any suspicions, but also... Uh, to, help, to aid in the murder, he'll, he'll never suspect them. And here's that line we talked about in the beginning of the, of the whole series, we talked about the gunpowder plot. And I'll write allusion because it's a reference to that gunpowder plot. She says, look, and notice, notice how, how often she is bossing him around. She's using these imperatives frequently. Remember, she's the, she's the, uh, the wife. She's supposed to be the subservient the character, the submissive character, but she's not. She's the absolute opposite of that. Look like the innocent flower, be the serpent underneath it. And we saw, I'll just remind you, actually, I'll get the picture up now. So here it is again. This is the coin that was minted after the, 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 the gunpowder plot was foiled, after Guy Fawkes and his conspirators were caught. Uh, this, and as you can see in the picture, you have, a, you have flowers, and underneath the flower, you have the serpent coiled up. And obviously, uh, the serpent comes to represent the traitors who are, who are ready to betray their country and betray the king by committing the acts of murder in the gunpowder plot uh, and it, it's a direct allusion itself to the story uh, of Adam and Eve and the fall in the Garden of Eden but it's a fascinating choice of words from Lady Macbeth to say look like the innocent flower but be the serpent underneath it it's all about the idea of putting on a false show putting on a false mask the flowers will cover and hide the true evil that lurks underneath. And that's what she, that's the advice that she's giving him. And she continues to goad and persuade Macbeth to uh, kind of join her in the same, in terms of having the same levels of enthusiasm for this murderous deed. She wants him to be as enthusiastic as she is. He that's coming, that's Duncan of course, must be provided for. And again, that's understatement. She's not saying what she really means. What she really means is Duncan, who's arriving, ought, it needs to be killed. OK, and you shall put this night's This is the key line. You shall put this night's great business into my dispatch. OK, if you dispatch an axe, you carry something out, you carry out an order. So she is taking charge. She is taking control. She has agency, which is hugely important because, again, it goes against all the expectations of a woman in medieval Scotland for her to say you're going to put to this night's great business again she's using euphemism she's not quite saying what she actually means tonight the night's great business is the murder you're going to put the the task of committing murder into my dispatch I will be responsible I will take charge I will come up with a plan I will execute the plan she has agency and the gender roles are complete I'll put, I'll put gender roles here the gender roles are completely subverted. Macbeth is mere, meekly following her and, and he, is, he is essentially effeminate in this role. And, and think about how significant that is, given how he's, he was presented at the beginning of the play as this Achilles-like warrior. She then continues, which shall to all our days and nights to come give solely sovereign sway and master them. She knows that the consequence of 
this act of murder will lead them to being masters of Scotland, to having sovereignty, this being being king, ruling over Scotland uh, for all our nights and days. And there's there's an element we talked about hubris in the lesson on context. She is being quite hubristic. She's being arrogant. She's ha she has too much pride and she's being naive. She doesn't realize that there are greater powers at work. The witches uh, will thwart, which means they'll get in the way of this, you know, plan that she has to be the queen uh, for the rest of her life. Uh, this is a, a kind of a, an ironic twist that happens later on. But look at how persuasive she's being. Look at how belittling she's been. Look at how commanding she's being. And this is to a, to a man who's just returned as the as a victor with the you know with the spoils of war. Uh, you wouldn't have guessed it if you hadn't if you hadn't read Act One scene. If you if you if you'd only just read this scene on its own in isolation, you'd never guess that Macbeth was the returning war hero. Macbeth responds, "We will speak further," and notice how he doesn't he hasn't yet made up his mind whether or not to follow this plan. He, he says we need to think about this more essentially. She says only look up clear to alter favour ever is to fear. Leave all the rest to me. Uh, and she's saying you know, it, it would be down to fear if we were to not do this. We, we are going to do this. The only reason not to would be cowardice. And then ominously the, the scene ends with that line we can all understand. Leave the rest to me. And again it's about how she has agency. She has control. She is the masculine figure in this scene, uh, which is a phenomenal scene, and and it's, a, it, that, it's that's where we spent much longer than usual on this on the scene. It's a very very important scene, uh, it, it, and it sets up a lot of the action and a lot of the consequences for what's to come in this brilliant play. Okay, so we are at the end of the play. At the end of the play, no, we're not at the end of the play. We're at the end of Act One, Scene Five. The, the Macbeths now exit the stage. And we move on to Act 1, Scene 6, next lesson. Hello again, Year 10s. Welcome back. Um, so that's the end of today's lesson on Act 1, Scene 5. Um, please do take some time to read through your annotations, to read through your notes, um, to watch certain sections of the video again if you need to. Uh, like I advised earlier, I'd really highly recommend watching the Judy Dench scene that you can look up on YouTube. Act 1, Scene 5, Judy Dench is what you should type. Um, and then please make sure you, com you complete the tasks that I've set you um, and the quiz on Show My Homework as well. And I'll see you next lesson for uh, another lesson on Macbeth. All the best, Mr Davis.